All right, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is my pattern, and I'm going to stick with it. I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. I'll introduce myself real quickly. My name is Nathan Hobble. I'm a behavior analyst that works at a DBHDS central office, and my job title here is regional crisis manager. But the topic that we're talking about today is more related to therapeutic consultation, behavioral services, or just in general behavior analysis. So again, I'm really pleased to have everybody here this morning, and I do appreciate folks taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. And uh, I see several people that were here on Tuesday as well. So thanks for tuning back in for part two. The training that we're doing today is gonna be presented by Dr. Neil Deshand from University of Cincinnati. And it is called an abbreviation, Plotting Without Deception, part two. So before I get into the intro for Dr. Deshand, here's a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. First off, You'll see in the chat box several links. The first one that I posted is real time computer transcription services for anybody that would like to access those. The suggestion for that is to use a separate browser for the stream text so that you could do a split screen and then you could look at the training and also access the streaming text simultaneously. For anybody other than me or Dr. Desham that is a, ends up speaking during the training, please go ahead and identify yourself at the start of each contribution such that the captioner can actually identify you in the script and then readers that are using the stream text service will know that the speaker has changed. And I also just wanna take a quick second to thank the captioning service and the captioner for being on here today and on Tuesday as well and making this possible for us. Folks that are signing in, I wanna let everybody know that the training session is gonna be recorded. So if you do not consent to being recorded, please go ahead and disconnect from the training at this time. I'll pause for a second to let folks do that if they'd like to. Throughout the training, we ask that you keep your line muted. For everyone that's in this training session today, please refrain from sharing any protected health or personally identifiable information for people that you provide services to or have provided service to in the past or would provide services to in the future. So any discussions, whether they're in the text or text box or orally, please only um, make, sure, make sure that that only contains publicly shareable information. For anybody that's interested in continuing education units or a certificate of attendance, we can make sure that that occurs contingent upon being here at the beginning and the end of the training. Dr. Deshand will describe what that looks like for any behavior analyst certification board certificates that would like to obtain CEs. And I know that there's probably other professionals that are on uh, the line as well, possibly some PPSFs or LPCs or LCSWs that might be interested in certificates of attendance. I'm gonna go ahead and monitor attendance today. I have everybody's email address that registered, obviously, and I can make sure that anybody that was here during the training gets a DBHDS certificate of attendance. Before I get into the full intro here for our speaker, I wanna note the following. What Dr. Deshand is gonna to present today, again, it's an advanced training topic on graphical display and visual analysis. So he might show some tools or offer some techniques or observations or suggestions, different resources for you all to consider in your own practice. And I just wanna stress for everybody that's here, if you're providing therapeutic consultation behavioral services, or perhaps you're interested in doing that in the future, those resources, their recommendations and resources alone, they're not a regulatory requirement to complete graphing the exact way that Dr. Deshand describes. I will say though that it is a regulatory requirement for therapeutic consultation behavioral services to have data provided using an acceptable visual display. And I kind of gave this same type of information on the intro training that I did a week ago today, and also the one that I, when I did the intro to this part one on Tuesday. So kind of what I will say though, is that we put this training series together as a way to give more info and resources to anybody that's interested in learning about best practice and behavioral graphing and visual analysis. So if you're not aware of the particulars that are gonna be shared today, what has been on Tuesday and will be presented today could be really, really valuable and useful to you in your own practice. So with all that noted, let me shift over and introduce our speaker. Again, I'm very, very excited to have Dr. Neil Deshand here today. 
for the, the second part of this two part training series. Dr. Deshand is an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati, where he teaches applied behavior analysis coursework and the master's online distance program. He's worked extensively with individuals that exhibit behaviors that are dangerous to self as well as others and consulted on numerous crisis situations to ensure that people that need such services receive them in the least intrusive and most effective way possible. And he has numerous publications as well on a variety of topics in the professional literature, including quality assurance on behavioral graphing practices, behavioral health, and creating interactive ethical decision-making tools. Without further ado, let me turn it over now to Dr. Neil Deshand for Plotting Without Disruption Part 2. Thanks so much. I'm very grateful to be here. And again, thank you for anyone that's already signed up and watched part, part one. And if you're just following on in part two, I'll try and make this as kind of uh, easy to follow as possible. Each of you basically should have some knowledge about how to use a computer, how to access Microsoft Excel. And I recommend that you have your computers up potentially with Excel and uh, download the templates for this one. So there's a Dropbox link that I provided uh, just below the closed captioning link uh, that Nathan mentioned. Uh, so if you can click that and start downloading it, if you haven't already, uh, that, I think that'll be very helpful because we'll actually be able to do some rehearsal practice stuff in this, this okay. session. Um, you should know the benefits of creating a uh, single subject design as well as the basics, and you should have a good understanding how to, you know, copy and paste the Excel templates that I would use. My recommendation is to make two copies from the outset so that you keep a master uh, that you have as an edited version uh, when you create them for your clients. Just a quick recap on essential graph features. We should have labels on our axes, whether it's the at the point where the point for horizontal or the vertical axes. Uh, you should have condition change lines as well as condition change labels so people can know what you're doing and if it's having an effect. Uh, you should have data points, which are your variables that you're targeting. And you should have the uh, data paths linked uh, so that we visually we can follow along and say, hey, this in this phase, they're all together. We should look at them as kind of one, you know, uh, kind of operant unit. And so we can look at trend level and variability, which I discussed in the previous um, presentation. For us, we don't have the figure captions, which are usually a re research based requirement, but we would have probably a title for the individual. So we might have the name of the individual providing services or the setting that it is occurring in our intervention. Um, I recommend that we use descriptive phase labels, not A or B. So sometimes you'll see A or B, and that doesn't tell us what happened. Uh, e in, even having A for baseline, I think that's counterintuitive because baseline begins with B. Um, I recommend using visual aids where possible, especially for training purposes. Perhaps you don't need them, but sometimes the RBTs that we're working with cannot see trends. Uh, I've had discussions with some of my students and there'll be an argument whether it's an ascending or descending trend and it really shouldn't be an argument because it should be something we can see. And if we can't see it, maybe we need some aids to do so. I also recommend uh, functionally aligning graphs and I think a lot of people do. And what that, what that means is if you have a behavior that's maintained by a single function like attention, then you might want to present below that other behaviors that are also maintained by attention, especially if your intervention is focusing on that. And if there's other uh, behaviors that you're also tracking that are maintained by other functions, maybe those should be presented aligned in a different panel. So that's just a recommendation. Again, these are preferences. There are going to be some art in terms of the science of how we do our like visual analysis. So um, I'm just picking up the things that have helped me make good decisions. Um, again, I would put data points that align with function consistently as well. So like if I had two behaviors like, uh, aggression and property destruction, and they're aligned by the same function, I might use a square for aggression and a diamond for property destruction because visually they're kind of similar. And then I might put a circle and like, a some other, like, a like, a like an X or something for the, for another one so that I can say, Hey, and I might keep, keep them consistently. So even I have, even if I have like 30 clients at a time, 
I can go quickly back and forth without getting eye strain. It's like, what was that behavior? Well, I know because I consistently use that data point for that behavior but it, it, when, I, when it occurs consistently across clients. I also like to chart missing data as well as opportunities. And, and, and one of the things we're going to go over, which as a quality assurance uh, like supervisor in Florida, like we, we, you would see sometimes percentages presented without opportunities. And I, I can tell you that can be very deceptive. And so we'll go over how that can kind of ruin our understanding of the data or make us think that things are going well when they're not. <clears throat> So I mentioned organize your data by function, insert data that's equivalent. Uh, so if you're tracking session uh, uh, session data, you should probably take your session data consistently. So if you take it at a certain time in the day, that's very beneficial. It's the same, I, I recommend using date data where possible because we can at least see when there were gaps in observation periods. And that's natural in the practice of behavior analysis. Uh, clients get sick, we get sick where we're out of the office or a COVID happens. And that part might not be as natural, but those things will crop up in practice. And I recommend using panels if possible. And I also made the recommendation in the previous lecture that it can be uh, challenging to put your data, your, uh, your graphs in the spreadsheet with your uh, data entry, because as you insert rows, it alters the graph or it might change you know, the size and shape of your graph. So putting it in a separate chart tab might be very beneficial, or even just having a separate spreadsheet just dedicated to your graphs so that there's kind of a separation between the data entry and the graphs themselves, just to avoid accidental issues. Um, I recommend color coding phase change lines, and you won't see that recommendation in uh, graphs in publications because a lot of them are printed in black and white. Uh, but I, I, I truly believe that it helps uh, with visual analysis, if we have uh, visual reminders, visual aids, because uh, it's tough. There's a lot of patterns going on. Uh, weekends change things. Monthly cycles change things. You can have aggression cycling because someone's manding for uh, some kind of relief. And that's not a behavioral issue. That could be, we need to go to the doctor. And so, although we don't have like, AI, like some of the big companies do to predict consumer trends. If we use some visual reminders, like highlighting weekends, for example, on your spreadsheet, maybe we can start seeing patterns more easily. Um, I'm going to skip some of these, but uh, outliers, for example, if you know that you have an extremely high point and it's because of an issue that may not be behavioral nature, um, such as like, someone had an extreme toothache, right? And there was an, ex an ex exorbitant amount of aggression that it just completely is out of the path of every other data point you have. If you were to chart that at the high point, that would reduce the bounce of all the other data points. And what that means is, say that's 100, and all my other data points are in the range of like 20 and 15, I won't be able to see that small jumps between 20 and 15, 20 and 18, because of that hundred, you know, occurrences in that in that instance. But if it can be explained, Sidman says, uh, Sidman's a very famous researcher, he says it's irresponsible for the storyteller essentially to present that outlier um, because it reduces the other parts of the story. So we uh, now I'm not saying take out data, because that that kind of can be deceptive in itself, but if you can present a present it in the graph and say, this is an outlier and explain why, then that might be something you can do. This is the example of a, a great graph. It's from Cooper, Heron, and Hewitt. Um, those are the essential elements I discussed, uh, the axes labels, the phase change lines and labels, the phase change, uh, the data, data lines are not going across the phase labels. So between the different labels, uh, like baseline blocking, the line between the data points are not connected, they're separated out. It's a best practice so we can visually see we should treat these as separate. Um, graphing best practices, I recommend the visual aids, functionally aligning graphs. Um, and I'll present this uh, PowerPoint. You've got, you should have this PowerPoint as well. Um, so you should be able to see all this stuff. But one of the th big things that we'll see 
is overlapping data points. And if overlapping data points are pretty common, there are a couple strategies to kind of resolve that issue, especially if it interferes with visual analysis. One is one of them is to reduce the size of the data point. Another is to change the fill. So if one is a black fill, well, it's gonna it's gonna be in front of the other data point. So you could change it to a white fill or a transparent fill. You could change the shape uh, of the other data objects. You could make uh, the objects transparent. And it really, whichever one you choose depends on the type of data. If you have lots of data, uh, I don't recommend reducing it, but some people have like big data. And again, just like outliers, they might not be informative in the story. Uh, the old practice was to jitter the data point, which is actually changing the coordinates of that data point. Um, I'm not a fan of that either because it, I feel like that's slightly deceptive too. And they only did that because transparency and changing size within like the graphical features from like the seventies and eighties weren't available. So here's kind of an image of what it could look like. So say I've got an overlapping series, the, um, data points on the left are two or more data points. So in this case, there's two circles. You can't really see that. But if you change the size of one of them, I can see one inside the other. Use transparency. Well, now they're overlapping, uh, but because they have a slight gray tinge, it becomes a little darker. And if there was three, that would become darker in itself. So it becomes more, more um, visually uh, accessible to see the data points getting darker and darker and the overlap occurring. That jitter example is actually moving one. Uh, changing the data point, so changing it to a triangle. Uh, and in this case, say you've got a black filled circle, changing the fill could help uh, see the two different data points. So th these are some examples, just some ideas uh, of how to handle. And Stephen Few in his book on how to uh, avoid, like how to avoid these kind of issues, mentions all these points and how, to, how they can benefit uh, data interpretation. Uh, I like to present missing days, and I want to also talk about uh, how to uh, avoid some of the pasting issues we have across platforms and know that different pasting options actually do different things to the data. Uh, so it's an issue of Excel, and I think it's an issue across compatibility across computers. So uh, it's something to bear in mind when you send something to Nathan and it's in crisis and you send a Microsoft graphic object. Those are interactive paste options, which, which means that I can like hover over a data point, and actually see the number come up. So it's interactive, but a PNG or a PDF is an image. It is not interactive, but it's also uh, non manipulable. So if you're worried about like someone having, you having a Mac, uh, at Macintosh platform and someone else having a Microsoft platform. And that they, in the issues you've had issues with your dates changing, which happens, or data points just going crazy, then present it as a PDF, which it, or a PNG, because those are going to prevent the compatibility issue that we we find often happens when sending our data across. I also talked about like the benefits of changing the fill of a data point. I wanted to present the image uh, or the the story that in two thousand and two. Uh, there were fewer certificates, uh, behavior analysts in the world. Uh, there was a reduction for some reason. And I think there were changed standards from the BACV, which is, which is our credentialing body. And so I changed the data point to allow us to see the fill of the line behind it. And I thought it helped with that storytelling. So just a small, a small way to see small changes is sometimes we change actual like actually if we put a line through the data point but this is not a recommendation you'll see in the literature because um you know some of this is just exploring how to tell the narrative so one of the reasons why i think it's crucial to present opportunities it's because or at least use two axes to present it is because in this graph what we see here is it looks like there was an increasing rate for uh, aggression and then it reduced. So that's what it looks like. It's the story is telling me right now, but opportunities haven't been presented. So right now, see this little plus sign. This is a quick chart option, which is actually available in the ribbon, um, if you, which is the, the menu right above 
uh, below file and in between the spreadsheet. That allows you to change features of your graphs. So that could be adding titles, adding grid lines, removing grid lines, adding a legend, a uh, very quick feature to do some changes without having to right click each time, format the, uh, the chart. So over here is an example of creating a phase change line, which I talked about previously, which I prefer to use an error bar. So the error bar in this case stays fixed to the graph. The benefit of that is if someone were to move it, you don't have to move the line with it each time. Right now it's presenting a horizontal error bar, which is not what I want. So I'm clicking more options. So here was clicking error bars, then clicking more options. It's gonna allow me to see the vertical error bars, which is the one I wanna to get to. So over to vertical error bars, when I get there, I'll be able to adjust that and change it so that it fits the size of the Y axis. In this case, it goes to zero to 160. Maybe I can adjust that to zero to 150 and then make that error bar just right for this graph. So in this case, I'm just selecting it to 150 with the uh, expectation that I'll probably be changing the Y axis to 150. So I'm actually not leaving blank space in my graph. So right now, 150 is high enough to capture the highest point, which is 140 for aggression. So I'm not wasting space. It's important that we don't waste space in this case. And I'm also raise it. It looks like I'm going to raise, no, I'm not going to raise the, the zero. But sometimes if you have data points on the zero or the abscissa or the X, uh, the X axis, uh, it might be valuable to raise the zero. And it's just a personal preference. Um, it might be if it might be a waste of time a lot of times because very rarely do we have pure zero rates and if we do we'll probably discontinue with that case anyway and working to fade and work with another client so right here just a preference tick mark tick marks it really does help having tick marks because it helps you see where the sessions are it's a visual aid the unfortunate thing about excel is it gives everything in grayscale so the text is in grayscale, the lines are in grayscale. Um, so it's a feature I'm not, not a fan of, uh, but I like to turn, turn it into a solid black line with possible. It really helps it pop out in the data. Um, in this case, I'm gonna be changing the marker also to a solid uh, option. I'm gonna be changing it to a square or a diamond. Square is usually my preference. I'm a square like that. In this case, I'm putting it to a gray fill. And this is just uh, just what strikes me at this moment. You know, th these are personal preferences. There's no right or wrong on this, just like Nathan said. Here I mentioned the grayscale doesn't, it, it is, is not as easy to see. So then turning, using, using the former axes tab, I have all these options here to change the line features and changing the color from gray to black actually helps really put that x-axis visually on the map. Now I'm doing the same for the y-axis. And the, the tradition here is to delete the grid lines. Now, the reason people say to delete them uh, is because it's kind of, could be visually distracting. Now, uh, if you have very minor changes, maybe the grid lines could be useful. So I'm never gonna say there's never a use for them because as you know, the acceleration chart, which is a chart used by others, it's not very popular around the US, it has lots of grid lines, lots and lots of grid lines, and it's a very useful graph. And so again, just this is this is the standard that people like getting rid of the grid. Another thing that I don't like about Excel, in this case, the session ends at 25. I have to manually change that to end at 25 by clicking on the right, uh, the right clicking on the x-axis, format x-axis, axi and then setting up my major and min values to be zero for min and 25 for max. So right now I'm labeling the axes, something you can do again in grayscale. I'm probably gonna change this to um, be the font of like black, uh, so it's not gray anymore. So it pops out a bit better. Change the title so that we so people know what what people are looking at. In case you want to know, we're looking at aggression without an idea of opportunities. K no bueno. So what happens 
when we start putting in opportunities? What happens to our data? What if we find these are the rates? So this is the opportunity per hours. So in case this is, I don't know if you get your, it's probably unlikely that you get your hours in 0.6 uh, level. You might put it in minutes, but you can make the appropriate calculations and change them as you need to. But just for the sake of ease, I put it in a uh, decimal format. What we're going to do here is it's going to, I'm going to do some simple math. I'll be using the, um, the formula bar and I will be making sure that I can create a rate by doing 40 divided by the opportunities. I'm going to get a rate amount. So here I'm actually adding opportunities and I'm actually just seeing, Hey, if I present opportunities in my graph and I put it in the graph with the actual uh, frequency counts, then maybe I can look at them together and get some visual like analysis before I do the rate data. Maybe I'll question for you for, for all of the listeners. Sorry to interrupt there. Yeah. Um, when you say opportunities, are you referring to a unit of time like hours essentially? Oh, I see now opportunity yeah. per hour. Okay. Yes. So, Thank so you. yeah, no, so th that's a great point. So I so, say I'm a say I'm an unethical behavior analyst. Say I want to show everyone that I'm the best, but I don't actually want to do any work, right? This is, I don't do this, but this is something no one should do. But one thing someone could do would be to reduce the observations in the intervention. And then that limits the opportunities for the, to even see the behavior. And so you'll see high rates in baseline, low rates in your intervention. Everyone looking at the graph might say, hey, great. Looks like everything's great. But they're only using frequency, and they were actually the, the rate actually tells the story that you haven't done any work. And so opportunity is a, is a time of your counting. How, how many times, how long were you there? Now, if your observations are constantly changing, it's very important for you as a behavior analyst to identify that this could be an issue with my data when I present just frequency by itself. If, however, you always watch an hour every day, you always have the same consistent observations. You're in a, a lot of times, if you're in a group home, if you're in a center, it's partial interval throughout the throughout the day, and the you've got a complete same counting time floor, uh, which is a technical term for just your observations are the same. That's a great point, Nathan. Thank you for like mentioning that because I think this is one of the deceptive areas in graphing behavioral data. If you're opportunities, your, your times of ob observations are changing, then you must either present that in your graph or you present rate. So this is one method that you can do. I'm presenting, I'm going to present in this graph, the opportunity by adding this to this graph, and I'm going to put it on a separate Y axis. So this is an example of me doing some, doing some work right now. You see it only in the frequency count. And that's not very helpful because I can't see anything from this. So what would be useful in this count is to add a second Y axis. And this can be done by right clicking on the series you want to add and then going to the format the, the format data series which is on the right. And see here in the series options, there's a, there's a second secondary Y axis. So you see the little um, icon that has a bar chart Right here, I'm clicking on that and just clicking secondary Y axis. The useful thing for that there, there is this allows me to see I've got an issue. My frequency is correlated with my opportunities. What does that mean? That means that as I watch more, there's more aggression. As I watch less, there's less aggression. And it carries on into my intervention, which I haven't labeled, so shame on this graph. But that means that there may be no impact from this person's intervention, which would be deceptive because if you look at just the data points without knowing that, that this frequency has different times of observations, this correlation is problematic because we don't know if the person has done their job. Now, I mentioned I'm just going to turn this into rate. So I'm using the formula bar, which is right below the ribbon, just above the ABCD of the uh, spreadsheet. And we're adding, first I'm putting an equal sign in, 
because then the Excel knows you want to do some kind of math. I'm clicking on a cell. In this case, it's C2, which is the location of my frequency count regression. I'm using the backslash key, which is basically simple format for division, dividing the over opportunity hours to get a rate. And then, oh, right, beautiful. So I just used a double click in the corner of the cell for Excel to predict, hey, I want you to divide all these cells for me without having to type back and forth C14 divided by D14, C13 divided by D13. Excel predicts what I want, does it for me. Now I've got rate data. In this cell where I have the phase change line because I don't have any data in it and I'm using 712 twice, which is I'm using it 712 and it's at 12 p.m. So it's right in between 712 and 713. It's got hashtag div divided by zero. That means there's an error. Zero divided by zero is something that's impossible for the computer to figure out. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those error variables. Now I'm going to just add uh, the rate data, kind of the same format, giving it a name. I could, I could link that to a cell or I could type it in manually. The problem with typing it in manually, like I just did, it won't change if I change that cell. So bear that in mind. And then I'm just selecting the data, one for the y-axis and one for the x-axis. X-axis is going to contain the date data. Y-axis is going to contain the, um, the actual rate data. And in this case, you can see it's actually worse in the intervention. There's actually more spikes in the intervention than uh, the actual baseline. So that's something that's going to be very problematic when looking at this in terms of we've got no change, we've got worse than that, we've got worse change. And then when we present it with uh, what I would say removing, just, just focusing on the 66 and 72, which is the range uh, that we're looking at, um, you can see it's, it's more of a spike. So we've got a bit of a spike going on between the, and it could be a potentially increasing trend. So changing the name of the graph, rate, I should probably label this axis and then uh, change the data points to be able to clean up the graph as I would prefer. So now looking at the rate data, I can then adjust my secondary y axes and add in some of the information. Add in that it's rate data, add in that we've got um, tightening at the titles. And if you want to do like little house cleaning things, you can change the uh, direction of the text by clicking text options and adjusting the direction because I, I actually don't like the direction being that way i want to turn it the other way these are just aesthetics i mean i don't think it adds anything to interpretation but aesthetics you can just click the text box to talk about alignment and change it to the direction that you prefer so in this case i prefer this um and then okay so another issue that i found with excel say you turn this into date data which again is my preference it'll leave that gap right there and it'll leave that gap between it. So you kind of have to go into the X axis, change it to be um, a specific date. In this case, I know that I started at 6.30 or just maybe at 6.31 or whatever. actually there's no 31 in June, but you get the point. I'm closing up the wasted space in my graph so that it's a little easier to look at. Visually, I think it looks a little better there to not have wasted space in your, in your graph. In this one, we're looking at uh, the idea of color coding some of your behaviors. So aggression and spitting I've identified as the function of being attention. Property destruction has the function of a tangible and public urination might just be a skills building issue. No function has been identified yet, but it's something that I want to chart in my acquisition skills. So I've highlighted them. Visually, you can do this by just going to the cells, going to the paint bucket right there and filling them as you please. Now, the benefit of doing this is I can present my aggression and spitting together. I can present my property destruction in a separate graph and my property creation also in a separate graph. So here's an example of all my data in the, in the graph. Um, how am I going to do this? I'm just going to, Oh, here, here's the example I was talking about before with 712. In this case, I'm using a gap in the spreadsheet to make a gap in the data path. Remember I told you guys that best practice is to ensure that there is no line crossing the phase change line, just for ease of visual analysis. 
One way to do this with data series is to create a, like a 0.5 variable, a 0.5 number with a date. And to do that in a time series, you just add 12 p.m. So I made two 712s, and now I'm adding in this 712, 12 p.m. So I'm clicking in the formula bar and typing 12 colon 000 colon 000 p.m. And so that's how I'm creating that in this graph. In my actual template, I have it set up so you don't have to do any of these steps. So this is how you do it if you want to make your own quick and easy graphs, just get them done and, add the, and without having to right click on the data points and remove the data path, I'm going to quickly create the graph for all of them and then clean them up uh, so that we can see like how, how we've got these graphs. So here's a, what Excel's given me. And then after editing them, I'm going to change some of the, uh, I'm going to add the Y axes and I'm going to add some other variables and I'll just skip ahead so we can see what's going on here. So here's a relatively clean up graph, but I got some graphs that haven't been completely cleaned up. Um, and then I remove, so I, what I hear in this one, I'm, because the DRO, which is a direct reinforcement of the behavior, targets spitting and aggression, I've presented spitting and aggression together. And then there's another intervention that comes in, a token loss for PD. Perhaps we identify PD property destruction at a later date as requiring some kind of other um, system. Um, tangible token loss. So now the person can no longer access things or, or, or make exchanges if they're engaging in property destruction. So that, that makes sense for token loss to be the intervention for property destruction. And as you can see, here what's interesting, this is for property destruction, I haven't yet labeled it. It didn't have a decrease when the DRO for spitting and aggression was in place. So direct reinforcement of other behavior, perhaps the person didn't receive uh, attention or praise when they were spitting or aggressing towards people, they were ignored. But property destruction didn't go down. It stayed in the same path as baseline. So this is a reason to present PD, a property destruction, separately. So I'm going to call it property destruction. I'm going to do some housekeeping, cleaning. In this case, I'm being lazy, it looks like. And, oh, am I being lazy? I'm creating, uh, it looks like a, a text box instead of a, a phase label. And so let's have a look at this one. So the next, the next graph is going to look at just urination. So say we have an outlier for urination. In this case, it says there was no diaper for a day. That's very problematic because we're going to might be have more cases of urination just because uh, there were no, you know, it was, it was very easy to urinate everywhere. And so that would be an example of an outlier we can explain. And maybe we don't want to put it at 20 that day because it would decrease all the variability that we can see easily within our graph. So you can see a lot of the data. So before, we'll go back to what it looked like. You see how the zero ones and twos, the bounce is very minimal because of the high value that we have here. The problem with that is we can't see the variability. So one thing we can do is we can change the data, but we're only doing this in very specific circumstances. We're not trying to be deceptive. We're trying to see variability of the other data points. And I wanted to pick that in my graph that I've made this change. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm changing it and I'm going to separate that data point from all the other data points. And I'm going to change the data point and I'm going to put a, a label on it saying, Hey, guess what? This day, something strange happened. That never, never ever happens every day. The person was running around naked peeing everywhere, right? This is. This is an example of trying to be proactive in our storytelling and explain to people, well, look, if you look at, if you include that, it's going to decrease your understanding that there might be a slight decreasing trend. It's going to decrease your understanding that, that we are working on this case. Um, if you cannot explain an outlier, Sidman says, include it. So if you can explain it, it's responsible of you to explain it in the story. If you can't, I think you've got to include it and you've got to keep investigating because it shows that there's a barrier between kind of depicting the story and the narrative that you're doing. And so right here, I'm doing what I consider the best practice, which is removing the data lines between that point so that you don't consider this aligned together. 
there's a reason to consider this data point separately from all the other data points. So then I will take away the data path, which is the lines between the data points. And I'm also changing the data point to be a uh, X with a gray fill. It's just kind of like, ah, I wish that hadn't happened. So I chose X. Why not? I think X's are a good way to, to say, damn it. <laughs> you know, um, and then uh, I'm getting rid of the leader. And, and actually, so this is, so the good thing about a data label, see how that data box actually looks different than a text box? That's actually integrated into the graph. So what I did there was right click on the data point, add data label, filled in this uh, text. And when I move this graph, it will move with the data labels. Um, whereas the baseline and DRO spitting, they can be moved accidentally. So something to consider. So when do we move outliers? If you can explain them. I've also got a paper on how to create scale breaks, but that's way too technical. Basically that's like a break. So say it will go zero to five, and then there'll be a line on the Y axis and that will go to 20 and 25. Right. But it, that's one way to solve the issue. So you put a scale, but that's, I think it's a waste of time. So I would not recommend doing that, but I do that for research graphs. Um, if you can't explain them, add them. And I recommend looking for diurnal weekly and monthly cycles, especially with behaviors that could have uh, a medical diagnosis or there could be medical issues. And this is the stuff you show to your psychiatrist. This is your stuff you show to your medical doctor. This is the stuff you show to your nurses so that they can kind of get in depth with the data with you and you can help um, with some of the decision making they're going through. Okay, so if you guys are doing CEUs, and even if you're not, and you want to answer some questions, uh, true or false for the first question, outliers should never be removed. You can put true or false. 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 Mostly false. I think so. And again, this is personal preference. So someone could say they should never be removed, and they might be right. You know, like that's that's their personal preference. I don't. I think that there are cases that we can all agree on that will uh, kind of detract us from the data. Use, using transparency for data points as a method to mitigate the impact of uh, multiple overlapping data points. Is this true or false? I'm a fan of transparency. But uh, again, some, I, had a, I was at ABAI and I was presenting my first presentation, I think it was 2012, and someone came up to me and was like, you should get her. And I was like, it was an old, older fellow. Um, and I'm like, because I had an overlapping data point and I use, I didn't use transparency, I use a dark fill and uh, the other data points were open for white. And he was like, you should jitter. And I was like, well, actually jittering is more deceptive because it places a data point in a place it was never meant to be. So if my, if my values open up at five, jittering makes you go to 5.25 to get it to get it to not overlap but your data wasn't 5.25 so i i kind of like i kind of try to say hey well it's probably because your software wasn't good when you jetted try to do a jab at him but i was really annoyed because he was like it was a really good paper a really good post i was really proud of it and someone kind of was uh ruining my bonfire here's a uh, I mentioned Stephen Fuse's book. Now you see it. It's a very good book. It's not by a behavior analyst. It's a, it's a, he's, a data, he's just a data analyst, if you will. And these are examples of both the same data. The gold points are no transparency. And the blue points are like a, like a transparency with overlapping data points. And this is a lot of data. This is mega data he's got. Um, as you can see, it's like a corona effect. It's like a nebula, right? Whereas the other one is just like a... Uh, it's like a, a, a pixelated version where you cannot see the depth to the overlap. So that, that's kind of seeing how transparency can work to enhance visual analysis, uh, something that isn't behavioral data. Uh, I mentioned this. If you want to do a paste special, you can use the function control alt V, or you can actually right click and find paste special instead of uh, uh, doing it that way. So when you press control C on your object, you can do paste special and it will give you some options. Uh, if you want to have a chart object that's interactive, then you can choose chart object or graphic object. That allows someone to hover over a data point, even if it's 
in Word, and it will tell you the actual value of the data point. It'll say that's 25, that's 50 if you hover over it. You can't do that when you send a PNG or PDF. So there are some um, issues, right, to um, sending uh, like a chart object in terms of compatibility. Sometimes when you send it across to a Macintosh, it will get augmented. So send. I, I've always sent the whole XR file and PNGs uh, just in case so that people can see what, what, what I saw on my screen and they can see it on their screen. And if there's issues with the XR file, uh, they can then create their own graphs if, if needed. And because the worst case scenario is someone saying, hey, send me your XR graph, I need to do your graphs again. And because of compatibility issues. Here's uh, some images. This is kind of different options. There's bitmap, GIF, uh, Microsoft graphic object, PDF, picture enhanced metafile, JPEGs, and PNGs. Each of these have different like benefits. Like picture enhanced, they're really good for straight lines. Um, bit, uh, uh, bitmaps are great for like color. So if you have color, bitmaps are great. GIFs are actually much better for um, like more vi like more video based data. But like in this case, it's just it's a graphic inter interactive uh, object. This one, but uh, it does. Some of them change the data point sizes, which is problematic. And PDF sometimes uh, you can lose a bit of resolution if you do a PDF from. Microsoft, but if you PDF from Macintosh, it's like doing a PNG. So it's kind of strange. Depending on what you're using, each one does different things to data points and data lines and can actually change resolution. So I just mentioned this because it it can influence how we look at the data inadvertently. Um, I recommended last time that we shouldn't use uh, 3D objects because say the number's five, it presents it as like 4.9 and you have to use perspective to kind of know that that's the very, that's the actual number so it's best to just use a 2d if you've got two dimensions i've got attention and i've got like i've got the functions and i've got uh numbers i don't need 3d a lot of like business people love pie charts and they love like 3d bar charts and it's not because it actually helps a visual analysis. It's just because I think they think it looks aesthetically better. I mentioned using visual reminders, and, and this is just a quick example of how I can um, create a way to see weekend data. I mentioned that it would be nice to see um, it would be nice to see when the weekends are. And when I look at numbers like seven one seven two seven three seven four, I don't know when the weekends are. So. In my template, I have it's already done for you. But one way, if you want to do it yourself, you can use what is called conditional formatting. It's right here in the menu bar. And you can set up things that are true or false. And I use the, it's an or function. So it's a it's a rule uh, which says, hey, if it's, if it's a weekday, throw in one. If it's a week, weekday here, seven, you know, give me true or false, right? And so in this case, it's going to give me true for the, the weekends and it's going to give me false for all the weekdays and then i can say if you if you detect this rule as being true change the color for me so now i can change the color to be hey look i know 7374 is a weekend and this will work throughout the year whether it's 2022 2024 and it's very useful because each day is different each number is never the same weekend day and maybe there's a pattern I can see in my spreadsheet. And so uh, I'm just showing you that, oh, by the way, 7.13 is a Tuesday, 7.11 here is, on 2021 is a Sunday, 7.10. I'm just verifying. I'm like, oh, I'm doing a double check. I'm gonna use my uh, calendar function on my desktop to see if it's true. I don't wanna show anything that's false. So here's an example of it. You say, hey, look, this is true. This works. It's a very easy way to, Give a rule, Excel to highlight something visually. It might not show up on your graph, but while you're looking at the data, maybe if you see some patterns in the data. And the reason why we see three here is because I'm using that like um, technique for creating a, a midpoint for my phase change line by using 12 p.m. So it shows there are three weekend days in this one, but really it's just there are two data points for 717, um, but one is tracked in the midpoint of 717. 
Okay, we're going to get our template one out. We're actually going to play and do something, which I think is very exciting. And I hope today that you guys actually have questions for me because I want to make sure that this is very accessible and that you guys weren't just like, hey, freaking out over me showing as many things I get excited about and not realize that I'm not explaining in a way that is accessible. So let's get our template one out. So that one will be called, let's see what it's called. It'll be called phase line label auto template. I don't know why I call I call them what they I call them, but I I chose phase line label auto template underscore one y axes major and minor. I don't know why I didn't add major and minor in the second one, but maybe I just yeah. So the second one's called phase line label auto template no major and minor. But I think I put major and minor in. Did I do major and minor both? No, I didn't. No, no, I didn't. So that's why I did that. Okay. So that's nice. Something to do later down the road. So major and minor really reflects the um, phase line label being a straight line without any dashes. And the minor is the one with dashes. And uh, Cooper and Heron uh, from the white book make the recommendation that if you have a intervention that maybe is is not super like influential, like, like a minor influence, then you might present it with a dashed line versus a straight line, a straight solid line. Okay. I have instructions. If you have a Microsoft platform, I created a neat menu. Okay. Now, for you to access that menu, when you open it, you must say macros must be enabled. So I will go ahead and open this because um, I do have it and I can show you what you need to do from the beginning. Now, the reason why Excel says, hey, do you really want to open this? It's because uh, macros can be used for viruses. And another reason why there's compatibility issues between a Apple Macintosh platforms is they don't want to even have a source of like a way to get in and mess with something. So they actually block these kinds of features. But it's very versatile. So if you have a Microsoft one, you can actually use all the features of this completely. But for the most part, you can still do most of the stuff. So if you press Control D, it will have some questions. What should I do first? Open client behavior plan, decide what behaviors need to be included on the spreadsheet and save this template under a new title. So the reason why I recommend doing this is say you make alterations to this uh, and then you don't have access to this template for whatever reason, you've already got your own version of this saved. And so like a simple thing I would do from the, from the outset is I would start changing the dates maybe so maybe i'll change this to january well right now it says it's february in this one so i've got february oh i should change it to january oh this is not working oh oh no oh, something's happened goofy on this we're going to focus on this I'll, I'll have to fix it later but maybe it's because it's fixed that's what it is i did something okay format xxes and let's make sure automatically let's see all right, that might need fixing. Anyway, we'll focus, I'll fix it later. But, okay, so the thing you can do is you can click on the date ranges and start by changing the date ranges. So for January, um, I, I, I can change this to January. I can change this on the scroll down menu to any date, uh, any month date. So if I want to start on October and I want to put this to, let's, let's put this to 2021, so our year. That will change the start year to be 2021 and the month to be uh, October. So, oh, it's starting to do it now. Wow, so it's something slightly different. Okay, right, I'll have to fix that. So we're going to focus on target, target behavior two and three, and I'm going to fix this in the template. It's probably something that happened when I uh, adjusted the goal change line I said I was going to add for the previous from the previous lecture. So what this does is it, changes the dates for you without you having to go in there and right click form an axis, change them out or go in and do a whole bunch of things. So that's the first thing that's very useful. The other thing that's very useful is you can create uh, progress reports. So say I want to just look at October to December. Okay, it's November, let's get to December. Actually, let's choose January just so I can show you all the features. Now, because there's a wraparound and October will go 2021 and January will be 2022, I do need to do one extra step. The first step is to change when I 
because before I click this button, which says update graph, I need to change this to 2021 and the end year to be 2022. That's saying because January ends in 2022, I want my graph to also pick up on that fact. So when I go here, you can now see that the behaviors are only in that range. And so here I can just mess around with that. Um, the other thing that's useful is I can change from the single cell, the titles of the graphs. So in this case, I'm going to say to my name. And over here, you'll see it's changed to someone's name. Now that that's all in the title update tab. When you go to the data tab, which is where you enter your data, you can see um, you've got your highlighted su Sundays and Saturdays, which I mentioned before, all done for you. They're in green, my preference. And I have a minor phase change line and a major phase change line, which is why this, this spreadsheet is called major, minor and major. Minor is going to be dashed and major is going to be a straight line. Now, I created a goal line. Uh, based on what you guys, or what I thought could be useful uh, from the previous lecture. And what you can do is you can set up your goal line by changing all the numbers to one set of, uh, one set of uh, uh, numbers. So I'm, I'm making my goal 100. I don't know what the behavior is, but I'm changing all these to 100. So here I have 100 and I have 50 there. I'm going to go ahead and change these to 100 as well. So my goal is 100 all the way through, and I'm using a dashed line for the goal line. If I want to start, because I'm using target behaviors two and three. Oh, why is it two and three? One and two, two and three. Should be three and four, really, shouldn't it? Yeah, three and four. <laughs> Things you find out. Things I need to change on the, uh, on the fly. So right here, say I'm using three and four. I'm going to put in some random numbers. So that's 34, 22. I didn't watch on Sunday, but I, I didn't watch on Saturday, but I watched on, I watched on Sunday. Okay. And so on. And then I'm going to put another one in there. And I've done a major phase change line. And the major phase change line is going to be behavior plan with function treatment. Okay. I started working and it's amazing. Everything's getting lower and I put 11 here. And what I'm going to do here, I told you guys that we need to um, create a break in the data and um, that won't happen automatically unless you go into your tab and see this cell, at least one of these cells between when the phase change occurred has to be deleted with a delete key. So over here in the formula tab, you can see there's a uh, number NA. All I have to do is press the backspace key or the delete key in this box here between these. And what will happen, I just pressed that button just now, it will break the line. I don't have to go right click into the tab and go format data point and then break the line. I don't have to mess around with my graph. My idea is, hey, can I create a template where I can just mess in the spreadsheet without having to go back and forth into the graph, back and forth into the graph. Note also that the intervention is up here. And I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this graph. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to put it in the spreadsheet. Okay. I've got this in the spreadsheet. See how I move it? The whole thing is together. That will only move if I choose to move it. Right. And I might get rid of that leader line too. But the beauty of that is that it doesn't move unless I want it to. Um, let's go, let's, let's just change the goal line to be 25. Okay. For baseline. And let's change this to be 75 or random number. Ah, let's do it. Let's change it to be 76. Actually, let's make it accelerating. Like reflect a more reasonable, well, I split it. 76 and then 77. I click both these two together because it's a pattern. And I'm going to let Excel predict what I need. No, it's, it's not doing it. All right. 
All right, you don't want to predict it? I'll give you one more number. You should do it for me. Oh, it just wants to could repeat it. Where are you? I'll do control E. No. Oh, fine. Usually it does it for me. All right, Excel being quirky. Let's see here. So in this case, it wants to just do, wants to do repeated pattern, but usually it'll like let you do a pattern and then it'll predict it, which is nice because you don't have to type them all in. We'll just do a step pattern for now, but here. Okay, so you can see there's a step pattern. Oh, let's see, I'll just do this. I'll just throw in the step pattern for fun so you can see it. But yeah, you can see how like I've been excel my goals are increasing gradually or what have you. Um, and so that you can see that there's this increasing goal trend line that maybe as my data is going along, I can see it moving along with me. But yeah, just to show you that it's 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 in the graph and it like adjusts with you, which is nice. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change the. I want to move it to February, actually March. I want to show you that it actually doesn't lose any data, and then you've got also you've got all those dates added along with it. What's useful about this is I can also I have a um, I have a little section for no data, and I I don't know what your preferences, whether what you want it in the middle of the graph, uh, or if you want it like um, at the bottom. Um, but let's see, you could put, uh, you could present it right along the bottom, so it's not in the way. And in this case, it's throwing some stuff up, throwing some labels. Huh. Delete format. Let's delete those. But yeah, so there's an example of some missing data. Actually, it should be. It should be along here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that missing, missing data. I'm going to put it right along here. You see, there's a long, a large place of, of just missing data. And then you can say, "Oh, look, I had a missing data period right here." I'm going to go ahead and delete this graph because, as I mentioned, I like to keep them in the tab. So. Right here, you can see there's a large section of missing data. But, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say whether, whether I should break, maybe I should break this data point um, between uh, because of that large space so that I can look at them differently. So the way to do that would just be deleting a cell in between any of these large spaces. So I could just delete this cell and it will actually break the line between them. Again, I don't have to go back and forth, right click, move data point. The good thing about this template is you don't have to put numbers in. You can just type the text in for the major phage labels. So I can say Rispadol delivered. It makes it small so that you don't wrap around, but the text is there. It just makes it small to fit in that box, uh, but you can change that to be wrap around or whatever. I just do that so that it doesn't expand the cell out like that because I don't like seeing that. That's just a personal preference. So then if I go to this tab, Rispadol delivered, it's up there. The face change line is with it all together. Let's do the same. Uh, let's do minor face change. I don't know why it will be minor Rispadol decrease. Maybe it's a, yeah, maybe just a decrease. So it's not completely removed. Maybe that's a minor a da a dash line for it. Now, in this case, you do because they're close together. You might have to move one of them. So that is the downside of this template. There is one thing, one or two things you might have to do to like completely like make it perfect, right? You know, just it like that. You might have to do that. So I apologize. I haven't figured out everything to make it completely like foolproof. So this is this is an example of using template three four, and I've just already just by messing with it picked up a couple of things that I really want to do some additions to. So when I made the temp when I made the template. Uh, one and two operated the same. When I added these in, um, so it didn't have the 930, uh, this thing happened. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and change it again and adjust this so this change in date thing doesn't happen. So it's going to be 
So because Excel does some quirky things. So you've got to go back and make sure that you've got everything updated the same way. The other thing I noticed was the these ones ended up having a data label. The um, no data had a data label. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that so that doesn't crop up next time. Um, and then if you want to create a new graph, right? You want to create a new graph. This is a very important feature. Just go to the bottom, right click, and go to insert and go to charts. Okay. This is very this is a very easy thing to do because this is actually how I'm going to fix target behavior one and two. So this is exactly what I'm going to be doing soon. Copy this. I'm copying this. Actually, before I do that, target behavior three and four is a bit nondescript. So I'm going to call this aggression with blood. Aggression without blood draw. Yeah, something like that. Bit. Okay. So now I'll just. As you know, the behavior so like the, the legend has changed right here with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this graph. I just created this by right clicking and going to insert and clicking on chart. I'm going to paste this graph right here. So now I've got two copies of target behavior three and four. Now I, I don't necessarily need two copies of target behavior three and four, but I do need four, five and six, if I can count. So why is that useful? What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create five and six, right? New columns. Now, the cool thing about this is all I have to do now is go to my new five and six, right click on this, and I go to select data. Remember I have three and four being aggression with blood, aggression without blood, maybe major aggression, minor aggression, whatever you want to call it, it's your preference. I have this collecting data from B, uh, from the date function. I don't want to change that, but the K is wrong. I want to now move this to M. I want to be M and N, right? So what if I just go in to the case very carefully, find the case. Oh, oh by the way, the uh, dollar signs are a means to keep the, the, the data from moving. So that's why the dollar signs uh, are in there. So I'm just going to try and find the Ks, change them to Ms. Boom, my first one's done. I can also do the Ns now without blood, right? I'm going to change this to, sorry, L. I need to change that to N. So let's get the L, change it to N. Let's get the L. And this actually stops me from having to drag all the way down to what I want to track. Then I press, very importantly, OK. And we have what? Is this done right? Let's see. Select data. That's still all oh, because the title isn't linked. So I need to change the title as well. So I need to do the same thing. Instead of it being K, I need it to be M. Okay. Instead of it being N, I need it to be, well, oh, that one's right. <laughs> I need, instead of it being L, I need it to be N. All right, now we're in business. Now we're rocking and rolling. Target behavior four and five. And now I can do SIB and I can do skin, uh, SIB headbang. And then SIB skin pick. All right, now we already have a whole set of new graphs ready to rock and roll from just one, two, three, four. And the ease of changing your data as you need it is relatively simple. I, I consider it's relatively simple. Um, and it's got the features you like. If you want to add features, do it. This is, this is just, you know, every time the phase label is going in, it's taking it from this formula, the hashtag formula over here. So it's putting it midday. So you don't have to mess around with 12 PM. Like I showed you in the uh, demonstrations of just creating a graph from scratch. And every time I find a feature I like, I add it. So that I, I've been working on this since uh, 2008, I think. So when I was first doing data entry, 
and uh, the bay rounds are like, hey, you enter this, and it's just like taking forever. And I was like, I need to find a way to make this simple, make this easy. There's always going to be quirks, there's always going to be compatibility issues. I need to find a way to work around them, make them work as many platforms as possible, but also make it easy so I can work with my clients, look at the data and find uh, patterns. How do I do that? I, mean, oh, I want to highlight Saturday, Sunday. How do I do that? I look at Google. I go search for uh, a blog and someone how to use the all function. Um, I'm <laughs> peeved at it, not predicting uh, patterns right there. Uh, like, Cause usually it does that. Let me just, let me just try that again. Cause I'm, Kind of, it's kind of funny. All right, well, let's see if it will do it here. Oh, there's like it's a matter of like there's a format over there. Uh, I want to do a prediction. Yeah, there might be a, something a mess around in this tab for uh, how I've done this versus opening up a new Excel workbook and the pattern analysis being a bit more uh, workable because this has been an old template and it's had to go through multiple updates previously. So it's kind of, I've all tried to keep it updated and uh, working with new versions as much as possible. Let's go to, I don't save that. Remember you can save it. Um, let's go to the template too. So what's cool about this is uh, it's got two uh, Y axes and actually technically the one Y axis has two. I think, I think it's got two for the phase labels. So it's kind of a misnomer, but this has uh, the purpose for presenting opportunities, which we already looked at as being crucial to ensuring that we're being accurate in terms of ensuring that we're like, that the rate is also uh, being presented or a way to present opportunities is being presented so that there isn't a artificial increase from um, watching opportunities. So when you watch more, you might see more behaviors, uh, the idea is you watch more and the behaviors are still being decreasing, which is it's, you know kind of a unique thing. But again, that could be deceptive if there's a motivational operation in effect, which means like maybe you're watching and the person's just given up on their aggression, they're tired out, and they could also get an artificial decrease from that. So again, we need to be good storytellers and identify kind of the issues that could crop up. Same thing, if you have control D, same help menu as before. Um, there is a help menu for Mac users, Command uh, Command D, like, uh, but it only works in older versions of Macintosh. So pre two thousand thirteen XL, um, it will work like old versions of Macintosh. But the two thousand sixteen, pretty sure it doesn't. So I have a red up here. By the way, you won't get the help of the pop up menu which um, tells you how do I automatically update my graphs? There's questions doing questions. How do I automatically update client info? It's gonna tell you to change cell G1 in this, in this uh, title update box. Enter the name of client cell in G1 of the title update spreadsheet. This will update the title of the graphs. To repeat this post for multiple graphs, insert a text box and link the cell with an equal sign in the formula bar. So it even tells you, this is how you do it. This is how you link a cell. So if we go to these cells, it is equals title update G1. So I go to title update. It's saying whatever's in this, present it here. Whatever's in this, present it here. Now you just save three, four seconds out your day typing things twice. And if you have 10 graphs, I'll give you a minute I saved you. And if you times that by a week of doing this multiple times with multiple different clients, you times it across an agency, I translate this to money. I'm not asking for money. Well, not from you, but I think it's valuable. And if I can save you time doing this, just simple stuff, it's going to get you to work with your clients. It's going to make you feel better. It's going to reduce burnout, which I know it's a heavy issue in working with some of the clients that we work with and the amount of load that we get when we've got big client loads. So same thing, you can change the dates and the months from a single cell. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> this says, do not delete. It really means that that's how this uh, uh, pop-up menu works for the dates. I guess I could change, I can change that so that it's fixed. I think I can, <clears throat> can you delete it? Yeah, you can delete it. So if you did change this and you saw something strange come up, oh, it says, actually it's still working. Decent. No, no, is it not? Oh, I, okay. Let's see if it's, 
Okay, so as you can see, I did change it. I'm going to zoom in so in case you can't see. Because I changed over here and I did make some changes accidentally. If I go here, we've got some new months. We've got DSF and we've got DDO. So don't, don't delete these. These, these are the ways for the pop-up menu to work so you don't have to keep typing it. Let's see if you predict them. Wait, months now. Yeah, now you can do it. Thanks, Excel. <laughs> Actually, let me check this on this one. Let's see what the prediction on this one. Oh, now you want to do it on this one? Get out of here! What the hell? Anyway, I hate Excel sometimes too. Because I, I don't know why. I don't know why. But I'll find out. And uh, when I do, you know. You guys will be the first to know. So let's do the goal line change for fun. All right. So here I just changed it to be a staggered increase. And for the most part, Excel predicts simple features. So if I was doing 2468, as I've changed that to 24, and that's my pattern, I should be able to double click on that little square right there, and it will predict the pattern. It didn't do it on the previous one. Don't ask me why. Um, but there you have it. We know that Excel can be quirky and someone with more skills than me will know why that, that happened. Oh, this one does want to do four. So let's do that to zero. I want it to be zero, five, 10. All right, perfect. So now I have my goals, um, in a staggered fashion. If you had a repeated pattern, you could do that. Okay. So what's good about this spreadsheet? Again, you have the same benefit of typing in text. Um, and then be able to put a phase change line in. Now let's see if it works. So for the test phase, as you'll note, there are two things you have to enter. One, you have to enter a number and you have to enter a phase text. Compared to the single Y axis, all you had to do was type in text. Now, the way that worked was I made a second y axis that was hidden and it was always going to zero, right? On the on, uh, zero being at the top uh, on the second y axis. So it was a little sneaky cheat I did. I found a little, little way. To get this to appear, I have to plug in the number one. And what it's doing, as you can see, is I'll get rid of my baseline one. Where's my baseline? I'll get rid of that. What it's doing is it's throwing in this data, but it has to have a coordinate of one because it's using 100% as the one. So it's saying, hey, I need to know where you want to put me. If you want to put me at 0 0.75, you can throw me down there. But it's picking it at 75%. So that's how it's working. It's working to find the location where you want to put it. In this case, it's always going to be one. Uh, for the most part, you want it right at the top of the graph. You want to show your, your baselines right there. Uh, so you'll be plugging in one and you'll be plugging in baseline. In this case, I had baseline already pre-plugged right there. So you don't have to plug it in again, which is actually a critique someone uh, made of my graph on a paper, which because I've forgotten baseline is <laughs> funny. Anyway, um, so there's how the y-axis works with the double y-axis. And it's important here that you can present your frequency data. So even this needs a little slight adjustment right there. Perfect. Let's get it right there. Things that, you know, you just, once you tweak it, once you've got it perfect, you adjust all your graphs to this so that you got, you can then avoid repeating an issue you find, find the issue, then use that template rather than build your graph again and again and again, do what I showed you with right clicking, insert chart, then go ahead and take the graph that you're working on. So if it's opportunities or if it's acquisition skills, this is the graph you're going to be plug plugging in, paste in, right click, select data, adjust the behavior, adjust the behaviors you'll want to target now. So in this case, I'm probably going to L and M again, or I could, I could let's just, let's just make it UC, um, attention requests and opportunities. Okay. 
So in my new chart, I'm selecting data. I'm changing my acquisition behavior one. I'm going to the edit. Remember one of my defaults is also show gaps as empty. So to show gaps between data labels, I mean, um, data paths, it's just using gaps. So that's a feature I put in right here, how, how my template works. So I go to edit for acquisition behavior one. I'm going to move it over to N. This time I'm going to remember to change the series name, change it to N. I'm going to change the H to N. There's going to be two H's on the range. That's done. Pinch request is done. Opportunities now. That's going to be M. No, no. Oh, sorry. What's my alphabet skills? Maybe I need some acquisition skills for doing the alphabet. Okay. Oh. All right. Oh. All right. Oh. Oh, yeah. And then we've got a tension request for opportunities. We have a new graph ready. We've got the same goals. In this case, if you want to set up new goals, you probably have to do a different set. This is really, I mean, I put goal line one, goal line two. You'll probably have to create a new tab if you want a new goal line for a separate set of graphs. And how you would do that is basically insert, right, goal line three. I, again, predicting Excel is being nice to me today. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have to adjust this series. Now, what I did purposely is I removed goal line from the legend. Um, okay. Just one sec, sorry. And so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and select this data. I'll go to goal line, which should be at the bottom. It says goal line graph one. That's not quite accurate anymore because we've got a third graph. I'm going to go into edit. I'm going to have to change the F's now to the H's. So just go ahead and just a little bit of editing here. Oh, I actually put a G in, so be careful, because if you make a mistake, Excel is going to find HG, which happens to be really far that way. Thousands of uh, columns over on my right, HG exists. Excel's weird. Yeah, it doesn't just do AZ. After Z, goes there. I think it's AA, then AB. All right, so I've done the H's. Okay, so I've got no goal lines for this. And because my uh, acquisition skills actually, I didn't have, I don't usually have goals for baseline, but my goals start after the intervention, which is going to be changed here. And I'm going to start my first goals to be pretty easy. I'm 25. And I'm going to, it's going to carry on until the person's got some skills. And then we actually achieve 25 and we're going to go to 30, 30 requests or whatever. And that's, that's our main goal. That's our main goal. We're going to end it there. Okay. So now we see, hey, how did I meet it? Now I can put my data in and we can see if we met it. So maybe at first uh, over here, because this is my new thing. And I, I left these blank because I wanted to show you that there's no trick to being M and N. It's whatever cell you want it to be. In fact, interestingly, if I delete these cells, M and N, even though they're different, the chart will still pick up that that change happened. Before, it was L and O or whatever. No, it was like O and P. It's now M, but it's pulling from those cells. So it's, let's put this back so we can see. It was O and P. So I go here, select data, go to attention request. It wanted O and P. Okay. Now, if I delete those cells, the good thing is it's still picking up where my data is very useful. So that issue of jostling or like things being moved around, I'm less affected by it. Now we'll just have prediction, obviously. Oh, not zero all the way. Now, yeah, let's leave that for now. Okay, so I'm gonna make a gap between here and then I'm going to plug in some learning. Okay. So here's my quick chart. Doesn't look great, does it? But <clears throat> a lot of data. It's a lot of data. These are holding 365 days worth of data whole years. So 
not ideal. I might change. Like for me, looking at this now, I'm thinking maybe the data series is a little bit too big size wise. Yeah, seven is way too big. Not a fan. So that might help a bit. But you know, one thing to note is if you just did what I did in terms of age entry, you're going to have a lot of overlaps because usually our data fluctuates ups and down a bit more. So it's going to look a bit more goofy. No, I haven't done a raise zero. I don't know if there's a huge value to do it, uh, but it, it can be done. So if you were to do that, that's something that can be added. I don't hold people's uh, practical graph things, the same research standards that I do. But if, if, they, if you think for some reason that there's a reason to raise it, then you can use, there's a task analysis I presented in the Dropbox on how to do that. And then hopefully you guys can, um, you know, I don't think it's that value, but, but I do do it sometimes. So what I want to do now, because I've, this is a lot to take in. I want to have, if you guys have questions, um, I've only got a couple slides left and it's really just talking about opportunities and things to consider, uh, and best practices. So, uh, if you have questions about what I just showed you on the templates, I would have you guys shoot them out now or put them in the chat bar, uh, so that we've got like time to answer those questions at the end. And, uh, I'll just, I'll just carry on for the most part of the reasons why uh, it's important to present opportunities with the data. If you start seeing that your opportunities flow with the actual data, then there's probably an issue here in terms of looking at, um, what is occurring. Like it's probably not the case that we're having a clean intervention. We're getting, we're getting to the point where opportunities are predicting the cases of if the person's manning. So in this case, it competency isn't shown, right? Why is it that, uh, one is fluctuating with the other? It's a strange pattern. It could be in trial competency. So what that means is maybe the person is learning in that one session, but it isn't translating to the next day. So how, how do I make that? presumption based on just looking at this data. It's not another data to look at. So it is, it is, it is an, maybe it's an assumption before presumption. Presumptions are, uh, more learned, uh, guesses. So why I would say that is why would someone just in that session have as opportunities go up, their score for percentage goes up. Well, and why doesn't transfer to the next session? So they're learning how to do it. Then working with the person, I would make the argument. There might be some prompt dependency. The person's learning. Maybe that therapist at the time, say, if you've got different therapists, they're learning to track maybe the movement of where the PEX cards going, or they're learning to do something in trial, but it's not having transference across session. Remember when you learn words or you learn manding, you learn a request for an item, it's something that should transfer. So this is a strange pattern. When you start, this is a reason why opportunities are crucial to present with the data. And some people do rate, and I think that's a good way to kind of avoid some of the issues we presented in terms of accidental deceptive data. It might not be the person doesn't know that they should, shouldn't do this. It just happens because we're overloaded with what we got to do. Um, and then I actually, in this one. And this graph, when I was working in the intensive units, I used to present reactive strategies. So restraints, um, especially with aggression, I think this is like crucial. Uh, you get a lot of reactivity when someone is put in timeout in the classroom. So I do advocate for presenting some of these other things that could influence behavioral data. So if someone's sent to, um, the principal's office, if someone had to engage in crisis management. A uh, number of times, length of time in crisis management, you know, interactions with the police, you know, Baker acts, uh, in Florida, that was quite common, you know, like day one. So one way to leave, leave, leave a facility is to get the police involved and the police don't sometimes don't know what, how to handle some of the clients. So I was like, I, and they're like, they've kidnapped me, you know, like, oh no. Um, so another reason to, to put some of those, uh, consider. If, if your client does some of those things, so if there's reactive strategies, uh, restraint procedures that uh, are used to maintain the health and safety of a person. So if a person runs into traffic, you, good Samaritan laws indicate you're not supposed to just stand in, watch, you're supposed to help 
uh, the person and make sure that that is for any person, not just a person engaging in behavioral therapy. They're not allowed. You're not allowed to walk by while someone's drowning. Uh, Good Samaritan and duty to act laws actually will make you culpable and you'll be probably indicted by your fellow peers if that ever happened. So why I present number of trials? I think I've made a good case. Um, here's a good example of why uh, it, it shows a narrative of someone engaging in appropriate waiting. So in this case, I've got percentages which are the open uh, white circles, and I've got total number of episodes to wait. So this is appropriate waiting. Again, I haven't any really baseline data. I, this is this is not an example of a graph I have. This is all hypothetical data. So don't be on. Don't hate me. But this is just hypothetical stuff. Okay. So as percentages are going up, so are the number of opportunities, and then they stay still, which is beautiful because then there's there's really number of opportunities or our demands that we place on someone really should be uh, matched to the environment. So if if someone, you know. Why would I increase making someone wait when they don't need to wait past a certain amount? My goal should match. Like, I shouldn't have my kid wait an hour, right? Like, how many kids in today's uh, kind of like give me, give me, give me environment, give me, give me, give me society have to wait an hour, right? Now, I'm saying like wait. Like, we're thinking about a waiting procedure where someone's just like sitting at a desk and not doing something. Um, I wouldn't probably increase my goals to something like that. And in those cases, uh, I, appropriate waiting would be probably moved to something like uh, not asking for something, right? I move to another skill. And in that case, they're probably doing alternative activities like homework, playing something else, but they aren't mentioning something that they, they're trying to get to, right? So there will be a point where you reached a kind of max number of trials. And then you still want to get 100 percent, you know, 99 percent, 95 percent, where there where, where there isn't an issue in terms of waiting. They aren't like eloping, aren't doing something that is detrimental to the quality of life for the client. So this, in this case, shows competency. I can say, hey, look, this data is good. I've got increased percentages. I've got increased um, opportunities, and the person's getting 100 percent. And it looks like acquisition. They're gradually moving to a hundred percent. Now, what if the story told me there were big jumps, like it went from uh, zero to fifty, right, between trials, zero to fifty, zero to fifty? What does that story tell me? Well, um, people call this a step up effect, and they call, talk about it in terms of motivation. It might not be that this client doesn't know how to do it. It might be that the client isn't motivated to do it. And again, if, if you go past a certain number of trials, they were 100% and you go to 20 and then you go to 30 trials or you go to 50 and then you start seeing decreases in percentages, it might be that you're losing seamless control, which is that the person's just not interested in your sessions or they're satiated on the reinforcers that you're giving them. And then you see this decrease. Why am I going to wait for you? You're not giving me any good stuff anymore, and I've got all the stuff that you've given me. So there are these patterns that you need to start looking out for that are like that will prompt you to change the number of trials, that will prompt you to potentially say, hey, look, there's an MO issue here. Let's find the reinforcer we need. If he's jumping from 0 to 50% or 0 to 100%, that tells me that all I have to do is find the reinforcer that would work for this client. You know, I remember there was a client that like wanted to talk. This is an older client wanted to talk about starting a business, right? And I'll start a business. I want to do this, and there was nothing else that seemed to interest him. So like tension, you know, like but that directional conversation was very powerful. And so we have to find the unique reinforcers that individualize. When we call it attention, there's a lot to it. It could be diverse. It could be. It could be attention from a preferred uh, staff. It could be a d attention in the form of a conversation. It could be uh, attention for doing an activity. Are you proud of me, bro? Yeah, I'm proud of you. Okay, so question one and two. When comparing graphs, it is easy when the y-axis have the same minimum, maximum values. And this is a question that's from the previous lecture. What do you guys think? When I'm comparing two different behaviors or two different clients, 
uh, cross many acquisition skills, is it easier to have the same min and max values? So zero to hundred, like for the Y axes, uh, versus having one that's zero to 25 or one that's zero to hundred, which one do you think? It's okay to be wrong. True, we got trues, a lot of trues, a lot of trues. I think it's easier. I can't divide 25, 100 by four of my visual analysis and squ squeeze it down to the right level. Yeah, it does help. Um, again, it is very difficult to compare clients in, in our line of work because each is an individual. So this might only happen um, when we're looking at age appropriate kind of comparisons where we're looking at like, where do we need a whole classroom to get to so they're meeting some kind of like state level benchmark perhaps presenting percentages without number of trials is better than presenting both just percentages we don't need uh we don't need a number of trials because like you know that's rubbish right false yes yes now remember too that there is a 33 percent so you have um three cards there's 33 percent chance of getting things right right now, if I only do one trial and someone gets it right, that could just be by random choice. And they happen to get it 30, they got that 100% by just chance. When I increase my number of trials and I present that, I'm also giving more confidence that there isn't what is um, just choice without looking. So when we're working with clients in like PEX or um, matching, if the person isn't scanning, which is looking at the array, so that's making sure the eyeballs hit the stimuli. They could be just doing right, left, random choice, right? And if you do random choices, there's less work just cognitively, but you might get 33% of the reinforcers, you know, if you've got three cards. So we have to think about what the chances are that someone could be engaging in, you know, some of the defective uh, choice repertoires. So scrolling or right-handedness picking just from the right side or left hand of this. People have preferences. So, or tracking moved stimuli. So if there's a correct card or a correct stimuli, if you don't cover up your movement of that stimuli to where you move it, they might just be seeing where your fingers move it and they might not be attending to the actual picture that's on the card. They might be just tracking your fingers. So it's very important that when we randomize our trials, we're adhering to best practices. Otherwise, our data doesn't mean anything. And then I do, I have silly things that I do. I, I do chess studies. I do whatever tickles my fancy. And I had this graph that came up where I was doing multiple baseline design. You probably will never need to, but like I staggered the step. So in the graph, the graph on the left and the right are the same. The only difference is right here uh, where I basically drop the line so you don't see them as potentially linked together. So there'll be things that are just goofy and just like aesthetic. But, you know, the whole thing is we're finding ways to give consideration to graphing, um, which, is a, which can be a dry subject. And the only way to do that is you have an objective, try to meet something and make sure that you're, you're giving that story a little better. Now, the idea here is like, I don't want someone to think that... Uh, that there's a straight line, right? So I'm trying to break up that straight line between two connecting uh, phase changes across two different settings. Um, so yeah, I have another who have good time for questions, and I'm very excited this time to be able to like answer questions about graphing or other things in behavior analysis in general. Uh, so I, I'm uh, encouraging you guys to make sure that we use this time. Otherwise, you'll just hear some tiny sort of rambling. Force Nathan to ask ask a question. All right, I've got one. It's not maybe it's not a question, maybe more of a comment. Um, so first off, I really appreciate everything that you've done for us with these trainings. And one of the things that I had talked about when I did the intro training last Thursday at the end was what you touched on today, related to taking those frequency data or essentially just account data and being very mindful of the opportunity to actually engage in that particular behavior, i.e. the recording interval of when you're collecting those data, um, which can be very difficult to get in a community setting. Uh, but you also alluded to the fact that sometimes, like i.e. like at a group home, 
the shifts are pretty constant. You might have, you might not be using continuous measurement. You might be using some type of other measurement modality that you described. Um, so I thought that that component was really interesting and I wanted to bring something up that I talked about in the intro training that I noted also was a little bit more advanced, but I think the same type of concept can be utilized for different dimensional qualities of behavior. So duration data, you could take that if you were, to, I hate the word non-compliance, but I like to use refusal, but whatever you want to call that behavior of um, lack of cooperation, lack of following particular instructions, if you have some type of duration in minutes, for example, you can take those data and you can use the same type of principle and convert those data to essentially a percent duration mm -hmm. if you know what that recording interval is. So again, it's the same type of thought process of you're sort of leveling the playing field for those data if you have inconsistent measurement durations, i.e. like you're you're there one day at the community coaching site for an hour and you collect an hour's worth of data and then the next day you're there for three or you're relying on the community coaching staff to collect the data but the individual you know they're there for four hours day one day two day three but then on day four and day five they're only there for one hour you level that playing field when you account for those opportunities to respond again that's if you have those data available which we all know can be a challenge in a community setting, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there for consideration and get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I, I think that's exactly right. You have to present your duration as well as you know as well as percentages because percentages do help you visually quickly get to that data. Uh, the the ideal is obviously your duration is going to be like as consistent as possible, but you don't have the same opportunities across, right? When you start seeing fluctuations in both the duration with the percentages that you can start saying hey look we've got something going on here a pattern in that like maybe there's learn like i mentioned learning within session versus learning across sessions the ideal is as the duration goes up you're not really having uh like another thing that you can say is like hey as duration goes up we're actually having um you know more non-compliance maybe because there's more demands placed in the person so then it really it's about picking apart your data and saying well do i need to include something else you know, like, is is it that there are all, also I have to include number of requests made of the client within that duration data? So you need to add a third variable to put in that tells a story, and that really is going to be the duty of the uh, the grapher to come up with what is this pattern, what is happening here. Um, another thing we should note, like I didn't really discuss partial interval, momentary time sampling, or whole interval, um, but but it is important to know that partial interval, people rely on it heavily. And we should know the caveats. And the, the paper by LeBlanc, or I posted in the Dropbox, discussed like, well, momentary time sampling, which is, say you every, at the end of every five minutes, you look at the last 10 seconds, was, did the behavior occur? It's gonna under sample. It's gonna under sample how much of that behavior is there. So you know, num number one, momentary time sampling is under sampling. With whole interval, which I think a lot of people advocate against. Uh, momentary time sampling, very useful for schools, very useful for lots of lots of things going on at once. Um, so there are benefits. The whole interval, which you, so will overestimate the duration of a behavior. So if you have these five minutes and you like say refusal occurs in that five minutes, it just gets ticked in that interval. And so it looks like it's way more than there potentially is. So it's oh, five minutes of, of, of non-compliance, but it might not be Five minutes might be just a minute, but the whole interval gets ticked. So a lot of people use partial interval. And what I really recommend is the consistency of your choice. So when you, and, and it's not always possible because you don't know the regularity of the behavior itself. So say a behavior occurs roughly every 20 minutes. DROs, directory of the behavior, recommend that you start reinforcement cycles every 15 minutes, like before the behavior, catch the person being good. And so should your partial interval probably align with the DRO. So your intervention, your measurements start like pushing together so that you then are making your life easy, number one. But then you can start saying that story where I've got this data tracking form. I can use it with this client, but then I'm not going to shift to 30 minutes or something else later down the road. So your measurement should probably stay consistent. And if you realize, hey, I, I've just been taking frequency for non-compliance and actually the person well, I counted one, but they were non-compliant for the whole day. It was one issue that was for the whole day. 
if duration captures what is important to the parents, to the teachers, then you're going to include it because it relates to the person's quality of life. So the decision of what we choose is going to be based on mainly three variables, your staff, your resources, right? The client, what they're doing and the quality assurance for the family, the stakeholders. So when you put those pieces together, it's going to inform you what, you know, like I can't do 20 people in a classroom and do like praise levels for everyone. If I have to momentary time sampling might be the way I do it. So that I go at the end of a five minute interval for this kid, that's great. And this one, I'm doing this one. So that way I can do five, every five seconds, this person's doing good. And I can do the whole classroom. That's a way to minimize the resources of data tracking. You're losing some integrity, some accuracy, but then I'm actually meeting a large group's needs. So it's a balancing act between what what's happening in the environment, what are your resources, and what are the crucial variables for like distress for a family that brings them to say, hey, you're actually doing what we need. You're tracking it in a way that it's never been tracked and it's working. You know? That's really helpful. Um, that hits home to me because before I came to DBHDS, I did work in community settings, mostly in family homes on military installations. And um, I think everybody that's on here, whether you're in a school or whether you're working in a community setting, you've unless you have a well trained team of registered behavior technicians working underneath you and still there could be issues in that regard. It can be very, very challenging to get the data that you'd like. So there does have to be kind of like this, this balance or dance to be able to meet the needs of the individual, get some type of reasonable type of data and also consider the resources that you have available to get that. Um, so I appreciate that you spoke on that. And then I, I told you guys that I didn't, this is drawn in. Like last time I drew this in. So like, I was like, oh, I'll chart this for you guys. And so I got these data points. It's like, oh, I can get it around here. And then, then I drew these, these parts and you can kind of see that's a different shade than that. And that data points a little big, bigger than that. Um, just thought it's funny to show you. Uh, oh, it's not, it's not, see. Okay. okay. Uh, let's do this, but you guys, um, here are the references for the presentation. Um. Cleveland is a well-known like data expert. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a data expert. I just copy these guys who I've like kind of, so Kabina made the recommendation of the ratio of like two to three, keeping your axes consistent, not stretching them or elongating them. Uh, and um, they're big precision teaching guys, but that can be done with a chart object. So when you, when you, when you insert it into a chart and not in your spreadsheet, it keeps all your graphs consistent in terms of that ratio size. So you don't actually have to resize it perfectly. And I mentioned Sidman, who is one of the kind of, he's the pioneer of stimulus equivalence and some of the new waves of behavior analysis in terms of acceptance commitment therapy deriving our RFT from that. So he, he did a lot on the tactics of research and graphical presentation. And then Tufti is also one of the kind of stakeholders in terms of that book, it really, it's not just behavioral data that he presents. It's just a book of graphs. It's a book of just lots and lots of graphs and epidemiology, advertising, uh, behavioral data, all, and it's a 2009 color reprint. It might be a bit expensive, but it's a real, if, if you, if you really, if you want to have these books for graphing, I have them all and uh occasionally i'll go into them and each time i do i'm finding new ways to conceptualize data and conceptualize how to present the narrative and i don't think that people want to read these things because it's like it, it's not a um once you've got a whole technique you've got your, your your kind of your bread and butter to how to do it you don't have to keep doing the same thing but when you get unique cases that's when you've got to start being inventive yeah, I think what you're what you're talking about then kind of giving that qualitative information is it is really, really helpful. And that's one of the things that just to piggyback on what you're saying is and I, one thing that I wanted to say, too, is that I really appreciate the language that you used about the graph painting the story. And the I say the graph is for decision making and the graph is an SD for you to make a decision or your decision might be that I'm not going to make any change right now. But I really like the analogy of. Um, the graph actually telling a story and the data telling a story on the graph. 
but we put into regulations that, that we hope that folks are going to actually submit like some type of summary, a brief summary statement of the graph. And that could be a good place to capture that type of information. Like the example of the grabbing the steering wheel is one that you're not, you're not going to be able to read that just on the graphical display. So I really do, I wanted to echo that just say as a way to kind of translate what you're talking about. If, if one doesn't have the ability to take pictures, you know, you might see that with a customized rate application, which is additional funding beyond the waiver. Um, process that we have here in Virginia, but that summary statement could be used to capture some of that information as well. Excellent. Excellent. Ed Neil. I was saying I appreciate you guys coming oh. and just echoing what you're about to say. Uh, you can give the closing. I just, I was going to, I think we're like minded here. I just thank everybody for taking the time and I want to thank you for setting this up. For us, the template, I think uh, just chock full of information here, but I think the template is a great takeaway that people can have that really might help increase their efficiency. With with graphing, I'm just thinking about how much time it would potentially save me for having to not just phase lines alone <laughs> to not have to draw those in manually and then move them every single time that the, there's a change on the X axis. And I'm going to change it again from just messing with it uh, just because today I saw some stuff that was a bit janky. So I'm going to go ahead and change some stuff quickly. So uh, that's the other thing is like, take it, adjust it, use it for your agencies, make it how you like, you know, it's yours. I apologize. I have one question. This is Deborah Nelson. Oh, go ahead. It was recorded, um, the session. How will we get that? Um, good question. Yeah, that's a good graph. question. Good question. Uh, so Dr. DeShand will share that information with me. I do, there is a process and sometimes it honestly takes a bit of time to get the recordings posted because they have to be reviewed by information security here at DBHDS. Um, so they have, it has to go through the appropriate channels to get posted. But once I have that information linked up so that it's out there in the world, I will send that link to everybody that participated or even registered for these trainings so that they can have that in the future. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And yeah, I, I, I apologize if the previous lecture was seemed a little fast. Uh, one of the things is it is recorded and it does help to just go back and forth. And the real learning is in the rehearsal and practice. And sometimes it's going to be difficult in these virtuals. I'm doing a workshop at ABI, so uh, if that will help. Um, that's in Boston in 2022. Um, so if someone wants to get some like more hands on like on it, so that, that will be available too. Um, plug for myself, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Nathan, for inviting me. Thank you for, uh, for all of you attending. And, uh, I appreciate, you know, you guys, what you're doing. Uh, you know, I know burnout's real and graphing is a huge pain. And that's one of the, I'm a, I'm an escape maintain kind of work. Guy, so I did this to get out of work. I worked hard to get out of work, but then the trick to that, if you do that, you end up liking work. Transformation of simus function. So that's where you 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 end up liking the function you were disliking. It's a switch, function switch. All right, guys, I'm gonna end the recording and uh thanks a lot for attending and